This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Claire Pomeroy, and I get the honor of kicking off our spotlight for today's meeting. It's really great to host you all here in Sacramento, and UC Davis is particularly pleased to be presenting some of the work being done at our institution that's been inspired by and funded by CIRM. The experts that you're going to hear from today are members of a UC Davis disease team that's focusing on bone repair. And what's particularly exciting for us is that this represents a pretty unique collaboration between experts at our School of Medicine, the School of Veterinary Medicine, and the College of Engineering. And we have both human patients and animal patients that you will hear about and who benefit from this work. You'll hear about studies defining the basic science of stem cells related to bone. You'll hear about critical preclinical trials with animal models. And you'll hear about clinical trials that involve both our animal patients and our human patients and include the use of mesenchymal stem cells to repair difficult fractures and treat bone diseases. These are our speakers today. We will have Kent Leach, a faculty member in the College of Engineering at UC Davis, and Mark Lee, who is one of our orthopedic surgeons at UC Davis Medical Center. Dr. Leach is studying mesenchymal stem cells derived from bone marrow to better understand the best ways to grow new bone, to repair non-healing fractures, and also to slow down bone formation in people with diseases that cause their bones to grow too fast. He uses a biological scaffold, that's where the engineering part comes in, to support and nurture the bone forming stem cells and really what he's doing is creating new bone. And then Dr. Lee, He's creating new methodologies to treat bone fractures in humans using those same bone marrow de derived mesenchymal stem cells, new and better ways to harvest the cells from the bone marrow in the operating room, and new ways to use the harvested stem cells to, to repair previously untreatable bone fractures and bone deformities as part of our ongoing human clinical trials. And I would like to just emphasize that all of these researchers work with the UC Davis team at the Good Manufacturing Practice Facility located in the CIRM Supported Institute for Regenerative Cures building on our UC Davis Sacramento campus. And that's where these cells are being prepared in the safest and most efficient manner. And as a result of all of that, that collaboration and the support from CIRM, UC Davis is uniquely positioned, I believe, to move regenerative medicine from the basic science of biomedical engineering through small and large animal models at our veterinary school to human clinical trials at our medical center. And finally, I'm delighted that you're going to be able to hear from one of Dr. Lee's patients. Dr. Lee is an amazing person who is an orthopedic surgeon on the front lines of our trauma center taking care of people with massive injuries after trauma and going to the bench, from the bench to the bedside. And that benefits his patients. And so you're gonna to get to hear from one of them today, Mrs. Diana Souza, and she truly reflects the translational capabilities and accomplishments of this amazing team. So let's begin, and I'm gonna welcome up to the podium, Dr. Kent Leach. Thank you, Dean Pomeroy. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, and welcome to Sacramento on this beautiful March day. Of course, March represents a change in seasons. It does 
represent the transition from the end of college basketball to the start of baseball, as we know. <laughs> And um, you know, musculoskeletal defects and, and challenges are a real issue in athletics. But as we all know, they're an issue in all of our lives across the lifespan. As you can see from this slide, the number of, of procedures that must be performed annually in the US that relate to bone deficits or bone fractures or slow and non-healing bone, those being bones that do not heal within an adequate uh, time period for the patient, is truly staggering. And here on the right, you can see, uh, if I can, there we go, here on the right, you can see that the cost of these procedures is absolutely enormous to our healthcare system. Not just for costs of treating these patients and costs in our insurance and reimbursement, but also costs to loss of work hours and quality of life. Now the gold standard treatment for most bone defects in society is the autologous bone graft transplantation. So taking a piece of functional healthy bone from another site in the patient and moving it to fill a large defect or to bridge a slow and non-healing defect. There are other opportunities as well to address these clinical problems using biomaterials such as metals and ceramics and here we have a total knee replacement. But what I want to emphasize to you today is that the gold standard is insufficient for many patients in California and United States. Specifically, we think about Roger Ebert, a very well-known, well-beloved movie critic who lost his lower jaw due to metastasis of a tumor. And after several, I believe four bone graft procedures, it was decided that he was not a patient, that this gold standard would be effective. Intensive radiation therapy resulted in the loss of vascularization and the inability of transplanted bone to graft effectively. Alternatively, we have patients, very young infant patients, who suffer from bone formation that's too rapid for normal development. In the disease process of craniosynostosis, we have premature bone formation in the soft spot of the skull of these kids. And without ample room for the brain to grow, in the developing skull, this translates to significant, uh, uh, significant challenges, developmental challenges for these children. And the only treatment for these kids is to remove large pieces of bone from their skull and then overlay the remaining pieces back in and hope that ossification or premature bone formation does not occur. Unfortunately, it does occur in a number of these infant kids. And so as engineers, and uh, bioengineers were thinking about strategies to address these significant clinical challenges for both spans uh, of these patients. So bone tissue engineering has emerged as a potential option for the autologous bone graft. And as many of you know, mesenchymal stem cells can be extracted from bone marrow, fat, and other tissue compartments, expanded in the laboratory, and readministered or delivered back to the patient. As an engineer, we think about how we can control that presentation and maximize the ability of this cell population. So many in the field have taken to differentiating these cells in the laboratory toward an osteoblast, a bone-forming cell, and transplanting those cells back to the patient, or perhaps capitalizing on the robust ability of these cells to secrete potent tissue-inducing proteins and molecules that drive the growth of new blood vessels and recruit healing cells from the host into the tissue site. Here you see some recent images from my laboratory that shows an, a mesenchymal stem cell that's stained in red in close co-localization with an endothelial cell in green. And these cells, we know, actively work to recruit and stimulate vascularization. So in my laboratory, we work pretty intently on developing biomaterials-based strategies to direct the behavior of mesenchymal stem cell populations. And we and others have taken to developing polymeric composite constructs that serve as an alternative for metals in implantation of patients. And the benefit of these materials is that they are fully bioresorbable, which is particularly great for pediatric patients. And also, we can control the physical properties of these materials very accurately. These materials are highly porous, which facilitate the ingrowth of new blood vessels and the migration of cells from the host into the defect site, and they serve as a temporary bridge or extracellular matrix in the bone defect. And so we and others have shown that these sorts of biomaterials are very effective at inducing differentiation of mesenchymal stem cells toward osteoblasts, and these materials can be effective in promoting bone repair in small and large animals. 
However, at UC Davis, we were the first to show that the composition of these types of scaffolds can directly affect the amount of, of tissue-inducing and vascular-inducing growth factors like vascular endothelial growth factor that are secreted by mesenchymal stem cells. You can see in these data that over time, the amount of VEGF was dependent upon the composition, and also we can see that this amount of VEGF is sustained, secreted by the MSCs, is sustained over a one-month period. We are very pleased to see that in small animals, upon transplanting mesenchymal stem cells on these composite scaffolds, that this directly related to increased vascularization. Here you see these values on the top of the image represent a mass ratio of bioceramic uh, synthetic bone mineral to polymer. So as we increase the amount of bone mineral to polymer ratio, we see increasing amounts of new blood vessel invasion. And as we accelerate vascularization with this very natural procedure, this directly results in improved bone formation. So here we see three-dimensional high-energy x-rays of these scaffolds seated with cells just before implantation in the backs of animals. After eight weeks, we can see significant bone infill in all of these constructs, and this was directly related to the ability of mesenchymal stem cells to secrete VEGF and recruit uh, host vessels and recruit uh, cells that can participate in bone repair. Histologically, we can see that the presence of cells results in improved and greater tissue invasion compared to an acellular scaffold. So this biomaterial approach is very effective at transplanting cells, but as I said, these materials are serving as a temporary extracellular matrix. So these cells normally reside in an extracellular matrix in the body. And we know that this extracellular matrix plays a tremendous role in the activity and the behavior of these cellular populations. And we and others have spent significant amount of time looking at how we can control this microenvironment to effectively direct the behavior of these cells. Now, the extracellular matrix is a protein polysaccharide collection of materials that provide critical cues to these cells. They provide sites for the cells to adhere to. They provide uh, instructional cues to tell the cells to differentiate toward a specific phenotype to grow and even to die. And so in my laboratory more recently, we've been thinking about capitalizing on the ability of mesenchymal stem cells to secrete an extracellular matrix. And perhaps we could engineer the composition of this extracellular matrix by controlling the specific culture conditions that we expand these cells in. And our goal is twofold on this work. Number one, that we can create a cell-secreted extracellular matrix that could then be transplanted and promote and accelerate bone formation in non-healing defects. And secondly, that we could create an extracellular matrix that when used as a coating for other materials could perhaps be used to slow down bone formation in infant children with craniosynostosis. And so this is a view of the type of material we're creating. Here's a view of the cells in culture stained with a Kumasi blue stain where protein stains as blue. When we rinse away these cells with a variety of detergents, we leave behind a complex protein polysaccharide mixture that we have since developed technologies to collect and deposit on a variety of biomaterials in a concentration-dependent manner. And I'm very excited to show you these data that when we look at the ability of undifferentiated mesenchymal stem cells to form bone, to secrete calcium, when in contact with these extracellular matrices, we see some remarkable abilities. Compared to mesenchymal stem cells grown in osteogenic conditions on tissue culture plastic, where we see very little minimal red, when these cells instead are grown on our engineered osteogenic extracellular matrix, they produce tremendous levels of calcium at very early time points. Now similarly, we've been working to engineer this extracellular matrix to slow down bone formation for kids with craniosynostosis. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this disease state, these, the cells from these patients are characterized by an increased ability to form bone. And so here in the top left, we see a dual stain for markers that are indicative of bone formation by osteoblasts. And the more blue and dark purple and dark black you see represents more mineral. So here we see osteoblasts taken from kids with crani craniosynostosis compared to osteoblasts from unaffected kids. And I know you can appreciate a pretty striking difference in approximately one week in culture. Even after just three to four days in culture, these osteoblasts are already forming mineral deposits represented here in this bright field image where you see the, the bright white spots. 
Okay, so these cells are already capable of forming a lot of bone very, very quickly. I'm very excited to show you that when we take these osteoblasts and instead put them on our engineered extracellular matrix to slow down bone formation, the phenotype of these cells has changed dramatically. They remain very elongated and we see no mineral deposition. So we are able to slow down this process and we're currently looking at it, advancing this in small animal models. So overall, the, the area of tissue engineering seeks to commonly expand cells collected from a patient and either mixed with a biomaterial that can be used to transplant the cells back to the patient in a minimally invasive manner, or these cells could be deposited on an engineered biomaterial and grown in the laboratory for a period of time for subsequent implantation. So how can we capitalize on the ability of these injectable materials to still direct cellular behavior? And this is where we're leveraging our knowledge in engineering extracellular matrices produced by mesenchymal stem cells to further promote bone formation. So we use a variety of biomaterials, hydrogels derived from fibrin or alginate, or perhaps implantable materials derived from synthetic polymers or even collagen sponges. And one of the more popular materials for cell transplantation, as you know, is alginate, a natural polymer derived from brown algae. But alginate is, has the inherent disability that it cannot instruct cells of how to behave because proteins can't stick. So currently, we're thinking about strategies of, of applying our ECM in these systems. And the way we're going about pursuing this is we're taking polymeric microbeads that are now coated with our engineered extracellular matrix. And I think you can see some pretty uh, striking differences between these fluorescent images. When we take MSC, mesenchymal stem cells, and suspend them in alginate gels with uncoated microbeads. The cells remain dispersed throughout the gel. They're not interacting with any substrate. Instead, they remain quite spherical. Conversely, when we put extracellular matrix-coated microbeads in our gel with mesenchymal stem cells, now we see the cells are adhering quite well to the microbead. And remember, that extracellular matrix gives us the opportunity to include cell-derived signals to the cells. So as early as two weeks, when we look at the ability of these systems to generate bone in an ectopic site in rats, we see uh, the, uh, the uh, start of some early bone formation with gels that contain extracellular matrix-coated beads. At six weeks, we see even greater mineralization. Um, and compared to the uncoated microbeads, we see very little mineralization. So indeed, the addition of this extracellular matrix provides a terrific opportunity to, to instruct mesenchymal stem cells to form bone. In collaboration with our outstanding School of Veterinary Medicine, which is adjacent to the Biomedical Engineering Department at UC Davis, we work to investigate the ability of these hydrogel systems and other systems to promote bone healing in large animal models, such as horses. And here you can see in work in collaboration with Dr. Larry Galupo, we sought to address a bone cyst that formed in the left stifle of a thoroughbred racehorse. The animal presented with lameness and inability to run. And together with Dr. Galupo, we combined the horse's own mesenchymal stem cells with a novel hydrogel material and injected back into this bone cyst. And you can see that as early as 10 months, the bone cyst has completely disappeared. We've since replicated these data in five other horses, and we're very excited about this moving forward. And this opportunity represents a, a, a terrific collaboration at UC, UC Davis to advance our materials from the bench in biomedical engineering to large animal models. And then it's my pleasure to introduce my clinical colleague, Dr. Mark Lee. And working with Mark, we're now moving toward uh, taking our technologies and getting them to, you, to be effective to treat human patients as well. Thank you, Kent, and uh, I'd like to say it is a, it's a privilege for me to, to get to speak with you today about my experience studying and, and using mesenchymal stem cells to heal uh, complicated fractures. And, and as a sidebar, it's, it's a privilege for me to work at UC Davis where I do have the opportunity to work with such great researchers and bring this sort of technology to patients. What are the problems? So in orthopedic trauma, like a trauma center like Davis, where we deal with high energy trauma every day, we deal with fractures that have bad soft tissue injuries and lead to bone loss. And you're looking at an x-ray image of a fracture just above the knee. And a, what you see is a lot of bone fragmentation. And, and after fixation, what you'll appreciate is that the fracture is well aligned and fixed with an implant. But what's more striking to me is the fact that there's a large segment of missing bone. 
this is a problem for this patient because just because the bone is fixed doesn't mean that this will be a functional limb. I think it's even more striking, I apologize for the graphic nature of this image while you're eating lunch, but <laughs> what you're seeing here is a knee joint and what you can see is a massive area of missing bone. And I think it's important to realize that this is a, an area that will not heal without help and a problem that we don't have great solutions for at this point in time. Fractures also do not have to have bone loss to have problems healing. And I'm showing you here a fracture of a tibia and in the central portion of the tibia, an area that just has failed to heal. And as long as this has failed to heal and without intervention, this will not be a functional extremity. And for both of these patients, having these unhealed or non-healing fractures, or what we call non-unions, will, will lead to great disability uh, pain and, and dysfunction. So how do we manage this problem? This is a problem that we deal with all the time at trauma centers where we have bone loss or fractures that don't heal. Well, we do have lots of older ways of dealing with them. Things like amputation, taking the extremity off, shortening the extremity. Uh, these aren't very novel or even bringing harvesting bone from other parts of the body to fill defects. We even have the technology to stretch bones, a technique called distraction osteogenesis which can actually grow new bone over many, many months. A segment of 14 centimeters might take you 12 to 14 months to regrow. While these are, are good, they all have cost, and that's really the problem that we're trying to address with the use of stem cells. If you take off a, a limb, obviously there's gonna be functional loss. Anytime we take bone from another part of the body, there's functional loss from that side and there's morbidity at the, at the harvest site. Uh, the distraction process I described to you is only gonna work in patients who can stay under treatment for 14 months. And we do have recombinant protein technology that I'm sure you're all aware of that could help us heal bone, but that's very expensive and has its own local problems with applications in patients like these. So what do we do? Well, let me just show you the, our current, uh, current techniques that we deal with, for, uh, that we use for these patients. Here another patient, a similar situation, a high energy motor vehicle accident. This patient has two horrendous fractures above the knee on both sides, okay? And as I mentioned before, our technique is to fix them at the appropriate length with the state of the art implants that we have. But again, if you look here, this whole segment above the knee is absent of bone. Here just filled with, with cement to hold the space, bone cement. So what do we do these days? Well, a great way or a good way to get bone to heal is to actually harvest it from the iliac crest or just above the hip. Uh, and as you can see there, we make a large incision and then we harvest out what looks like a reddish crouton type material. And that material is great. It's structure, it probably has protein signal, it certainly has cellularity that's gonna be important for bone formation. But the problem you can appreciate there is that's, you know, maybe after a harvest, you could only end up with 10 or 15 cc's of graft. And if you appreciate those images of those defects, we're talking about defects that might take 60 or 70 cc's of material to fill. So what do we do? Well, we don't have great techniques at this point. We extend it by using allograft or freeze-dried bone. We add ceramics that we have available to us off the shelf. And we'll even use those recombinant proteins I talked to you about, which are an expensive option. But really, we're just trying to expand uh, a source that is very limited. So the limitations I mentioned are the morbidity, especially from that incision, in that incision on the hip bone, which can cause pain and certainly has a limited volume. Again, the long healing times and defects like these, if, if we're successfully treating a defect like that, it might take up to a year to heal. And again, what's really are, what really are unreliable techniques. So as clinicians, this is frustrating. So what, what has been our approach? Well, our approach has been to try to use our collaborations and our opportunities at Davis and to use mesenchymal stem cells. And for me, I've worked on myself looking and improving the small animal models to help me understand, to help me prove that the concepts are right. It's to collaborate with scientists like Kent in engineering to improve the scaffolds and the way that we can deliver cells. And then the, what's a nice opportunity at a trauma center like ours is to actually translate this technology to the patients. My initial experience was in small animals, in rodents, and we did some simple fracture models. And you can see this is a simple stabilized fracture in a rat femur that we were able to successfully treat with mesenchymal stem cells. But this wasn't the type of problem that we were having in patients. We could, we could solve the simple fractures. And we felt we needed to move to a more significant or a clinically relevant model. 
And what you see here is a stabilized rat femur with a bone defect removed. And this has been a nice technique that we've validated and it's been perfect for us to uh, study and test mesenchymal stem cells and different scaffold combinations. However, what we've realized is that the larger animal models can be helpful. They can help us because the bone size is larger. We can use the same types of clinical interventions and implants that we use in human patients. And they may have higher translational value. And we, again, have that unique opportunity at UC Davis to collaborate with our School of Veterinary Medicine and our scientists and uh, clinicians over there. And we've done work in some larger animals. Here we're working on a, a sheep, working on a defect model in the sheep. And again, using a mesenchymal stem cell preparation to fill that defect in the bone. But I think what I'm most excited about is talking to you about the translational art and our experience actually with using mesenchymal stem cell technology in patients. We actually are completing one of our two clinical trials. We're actually completing one clinical trial and preparing to start another on a couple of techniques at the point of care where we can actually provide mesenchymal stem cells to patients with problem fractures. The first one involves using bone marrow aspirate concentration systems. And this came some from, from, from work that was done in Europe using a similar technique where they actually were able to aspirate marrow from iliac crest and using a rather primitive technique at that time, but then concentrate the, the fraction of that aspirate that contained the mesenchymal stem cells. This, uh, they used these in non-unions and injected them and had a very high healing rate. And while this was a very primitive technique, it definitely inspired us to try this in our patients. Again, we had the opportunity of innovation and technology here regionally with a company that developed this system that allowed us to actually, at the point of care in the operating room, aspirate bone marrow and in an, uh, with an automated system right there at bedside, concentrate it down, concentrate that cell fraction that contains the MSC, the mesenchymal stem cells, and process it quickly so that we could immediately re-deliver re it to the patient. So this is what the, the hardware looks like. Again, we would provide, this is all in the operating room, provided to us on the sterile field. We aspirate about 60 cc's of bone marrow from both iliac crests while the patient's asleep, so it's totally painless. It's centrifuged, handed off the field sterilely into a sterile, st sterile materials. It's centrifuged and again, delivered back to us. And what's delivered back to us is a six, six, c, six cc, six milliliter concentrate that, con that contains uh, high numbers of uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And what's nice is we were able to send this concentrate over, a portion of the concentrate, to prove that these cells were there. And again, with collaboration at the CIRM funded uh, good manufacturing practice facility, show that these that this uh, population of the fluid, the cells in this population of fluid actually did form bone forming cells. So our, our study for this uh, technique has been a single site pilot study. We're enrolling our, our last patients this week using non-unions or segmental defects like I showed you on the x-rays. Again, doing pre and post concentration cellular analysis and then looking at the x-rays, which is nice with bones because you can prove that they heal by looking at x-rays and then also asking the patients how they did which is obviously important as well. And I'll just show you a couple examples of patients from this study. Again, this is a, a patient, this is a forearm fracture. You can see it's very displaced. This is a patient from an industrial accident, had his arm caught in a press. Again, after he's cleaned up, the wounds are clean, the bones are stabilized. It's stabilized and fixed, but we're missing bone. And then over time, what you see is an area of bone loss that without bone forming, you're gonna have hardware failure and you're gonna have a dysfunctional extremity. In this patient, we removed his hardware, we debrided or cleaned the area that wasn't healed, and we used that bone marrow concentration system in that area that's not healing. And at three months, he completely regenerates that three centimeter section of bone using those concentrated uh, bone marrow cells. Here's another patient, another typical patient. This is a humerus or upper arm fracture. You can see it angulated. It's mo there's movement there. It's not healed. This patient also has multiple sclerosis. We offered him or we suggested that he have iliac crest bone taken from him, but he was concerned about his ambulatory function. He was already a minimally, minimal ambulator, having difficulty walking with his MS. He didn't want a bone graft harvest. So we offered him enrollment in our study. And again, what we did the same technique. We realigned the bones, we compressed them, and we applied the stem cells from the bone marrow concentration system. And here he is right after surgery. He's realigned and the stem cells have been applied. And here he is a few months later completely healed. 
So these are very, these are exemplary, pa these are patients, many patients like this in our study, and the outcomes are, have been very good. And just one other technique I want to tell you about, a study that we're about to initiate is the idea of harvesting MSC from the inner surface of long bones. We have known for a long time that if we grind the inner parts of bones and we place implants in them that have fractures that they heal well and we've had an idea that there are some cells inside the inner surface of the bone, the endosteum, that may have special ability to, to heal uh, fractures. And what we've developed over time is the ability to harvest this bone using these motorized uh, techniques of passing these grinders. Again, we pass them through small incisions at the top of bones. That is a, the grinding device inside of the bone, but it's got a suction system. It, it pulls the material back and collects it, and we collect it here, and it sort of looks uh, what people describe like uh, cranberry sauce, but it has some solid material and obviously the mesenchymal stem cells and proteins as well, and we use that as graft. Some people, though, started to wonder, you know, in, in the collection of that, we also liberate a large amount of fluid. And one of the th questions was, are there valuable mesenchymal stem cells that we're losing that could potentially be concentrated from that effluent? And so our current study that we're focusing on is a, a study with some very new technology to actually concentrate now, not from a bone marrow injection, but from that effluent from the other harvest technique, whether or not we can actually concentrate with high efficiency, mesenchymal stem cells from that effluent, which had previously been discarded. So we do have techniques at the point of care that we can provide stem cells, and we do have some scaffolds, but really every technique that we have for dealing with non-unions or fractures that fail to heal and fractures that have bone loss have limitations, and I hope you can appreciate those that I've, the ones that I've shared with you. So for us, ideally, as a trauma surgeon, as I look at it, the ideal implant for this situation would be something that's cellularized, potentially, that's a resorbable polymer, maybe a bioceramic composite that's populated with MSC, something that could be customized to size, shape, and strength, and something that's ready to implant, something produced at a GMP facility. That really, for us, would be an ideal implant. And, and the exciting thing for me is I think all of this is easy to achieve at UC Davis, and I, and I think we're close and, and we're ready to proceed with studies that can make that happen. It's a, a very special privilege of me to, to tell you about a, a very special patient. Um, this is a, a lady, she's a strong lady, uh, but she, unfortunately she, she had a, a fall. She took a fall from a ladder. She'd had some problems with this arm, and I'm showing you x-rays of her left arm. And, Unfortunately, she had uh, some attempts at an outside hospital at getting this fracture to heal. She had a fracture of both her radius and ulna, both bones just below the wrist. And unfortunately, not only did she go on to have problems healing this bone, over time, because it wasn't healing, it also started to angulate and became malunited or not correctly aligned. So this is an arm that, in a very active lady who's become not functional and not really shaped how it's supposed to, and the yellow line is where she was, and the red line is where it's supposed to be. So not only not healed, but not correctly aligned. And this is a patient who, had, again, who had had several operations, the soft tissues being very compromised at the surgery site, I think three operations. You know, this is one person who really needed something special and we thought would be a great candidate for our bone marrow concentrate study. And this is what we did to her. We realigned her bones, and you can see here, we actually, and there's some, uh, in some of you can see some hazy, cottony type material, which is actually the, the graft that we used to deliver some of those bone marrow derived cells, and, and we realigned her. And uh, she has gone on to, to heal well from that procedure. And so she's a lady, I think, who really benefited from our ability to do early translation with mesenchymal stem cell technology. And so, that special patient is actually here today, and so it's, it's, it's again, a special honor for me to now uh, introduce uh, Diana Souza, whose x-rays you just saw, who uh, was able to take advantage of the technology we have here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. And thank you to the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine for inviting me to speak to you today. I am very grateful and extremely honored to be here this afternoon because I think it is so important to tell you about my life and why stem cell research is so important for people just like me. 
I also want to thank you for hosting public information sessions like this one, creating awareness about the incredible stem cell research taking place in California is extremely important. I had the good fortune to learn about Dr. Mark Lee's innovative stem cell work from my daughter's mother-in-law, Leilani Corral, who worked in biotechnology research at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and she was very plugged into the latest news about regenerative medicine. This spotlight on disease is another important way to share the news about stem cell research and the benefits it might provide to patients around the state, throughout our nation, and even around the world. So I feel let's keep this going and let's keep up the good work. I am here today representing hundreds of people who unfortunately find themselves with a fracture that will just not heal or has not healed correctly. No one should have to live in fear of this. This problem is especially troubling for older people where quality of life can be severely impacted by a never ending recuperation process. I have friends and also have certainly heard many stories about people who have broken a leg or a hip and they quickly see their lives diminish as they found themselves unable to take care of even the most basic needs. The cost of treatments, therapies, and nursing assistance and support immediately becomes an overwhelming problem for those who suffer such debilitating injuries. For me, living on a 23-acre ranch in the mountains east of Reading had long kept me fit, healthy, and happy. Then in 2005, my husband passed away and I had more responsibilities. I was doing too much and getting hurt too often. I broke my arm the first time in my early 20s, the second time shortly after my husband passed away, and the third time just this last year. My arm was a complete mess. This fracture could not be easily repaired because of the three previous surgeries with complications and many casts. I faced a very real possibility of being left with only one working arm at a home and on a beautiful piece of property that needs a type of labor that gives much joy to my life. Fortunately, I found out about Dr. Markley's clinical trial to help heal badly broken bones. When I brought him my x-rays, I was so embarrassed and ashamed because my arm was deformed. It was very, very crooked. I think even Dr. Lee was stunned at the challenges he faced, but Dr. Lee looked at me and he said with such confidence, Diana, I can fix your arm. There was so much trauma to the bones in my arm because of the previous surgeries using metal plates and screws. It actually, to me, looked like Swiss cheese, just full of holes and gaps where the bone was not growing together. It looked absolutely very unhealthy. Dr. Lee didn't have a lot to work with, so I was thrilled when he confidently told me he could help me. And it was his clinical research using stem cells that I think made the biggest difference in my case. I still had to undergo a lengthy surgery. It was about six hours and somewhat painful recovery. But as I think Dr. Lee has already noted, he could have not accomplished nearly as much and enabled my weak and unhealthy bones to repair themselves without using the stem cells he extracted from my bone marrow to fill in the holes and gaps in my bone, which strengthened the bone and finally allowed my arm to heal properly and look normal. That surgery took place just last fall. Today I'm back at the ranch much stronger, outside nearly every day, taking Dr. Lee's advice, and I hired a helper. <laughs> And I am healing, I'm healing quite well. My friends cannot believe the difference in my physical strength and well-being, and I cannot believe the difference. It is incredible after living with such damaged, deformed, and unhealthy arm for so long. Those stem cells and Dr. Lee and his surgery team have given me great hope and optimism. It is really a new lease on life for me. I'm looking forward to getting back, better range of motion, and renewed strength, 
and Dr. Lee's research offers incredible hope to others like me who suffer these types of terrible bone fractures every year. I can only imagine the advances that will be made in the near future. Again, thank you so much for including me in this program. I am thankful for pioneering physicians like Dr. Lee, and I am very appreciative of a pioneering agency like the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. Your mission and work represents the promise of finding innovative solutions and cures for our most challenging health problems. Thank you so much. Well, Diana, you, you inspire us, and, and you're really what the work of CIRM is all about. So um, we have a few moments for a question or a comment from the board. Joan. Question. Um, I take I, the work you've done. Thank you so much, Clara. This is wonderful. Um, I have a mother who died with diabetes, and she had a difficulty in in, in uh, sores that wouldn't heal. And and so I'm seeing it, perhaps a relationship scientifically. I don't know if there is or not, but I'm I'm just curious about that. And also, would like to have sort of a a sentence in plain English that would help me convey what is going on with this, um, because it sounds like obviously there's been some wonderful progress, but that there's a wider field that is not served yet, and I'd like to understand where we are. And then ultimately, um, would more money speed that up? So I'm going to um, have Dr. Leach and Dr. Lee come up here and answer that question. And while they're coming up here, I will just say that um, we and other teams are also um, working on creating basically artificial skin in, in this same concept of, of, of healing in, in defects. So um, different tissues, but the same concept of growing replacement tissues. And so um, the question is, um, would more money help speed this up? And, um, and where would you go? And on behalf of, of the fans of the San Francisco Giants, this bone repair issue is of great importance right now. And you're absolutely right. Thankfully, Buster is behind the dish again, and we're looking, actually looking forward to seeing him this weekend down in Arizona. Um, but as far as to answer a, a one-sentence question, at least in my research and the research that many others are doing, um, we're actually actively using FDA-approved materials in our small animal models to help streamline this process and get it to human patients faster. Um, at UC Davis, we also have an outstanding center for uh, clinical translational science center, which is there to help us design clinical trials and move these materials forward. Um, but you're absolutely right. More money from the basic science side would help tremendously because that allows us to investigate the full span very rapidly on multiple animal models and, and for different clinical indications. Yeah, and just and just for me, you know, the 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 science is is great. The collaboration is beautiful. The but for us, the the scaffold technology, specifically the carrier from the clinician's perspective, is really the limitation. We we know the cells and and the potential of the cells, and and it's important to understand how they interact with these scaffolds. But for us, working with Kent and having the ability to prove the concept. Uh, and with more money, obviously, we could prove that concept because I think we're so close to the clinical application. I think, and I think the Kent's use of the FDA-approved materials has been critical. But, but we do have some questions that we want to answer right before we get to that to those human trials using the the combined the composite scaffold cell technology, and that's what we need the money for. Dr. Lubin. So that was a great presentation. That I was, I was just curious, being in a trauma center where you see a lot of these kinds of things. At what time, when do you consider you're going to intervene with this therapy in addition to what you do standard? Or would you try standard? And if it doesn't work, then go to this. Because that's going to be an important question, obviously. So in, in terms of intervention, it's, it, we see a little bit of a skewed population because we, we're actually, we're sort of sent the worst of the worst. So we yeah. see a lot of patients who come to us after failure. Uh, so I guess for us, the, what we, the way we look at, we looked at our clinical trial and the way that it was designed really was as an alternative. So at the beginning. So traditional techniques are there. We know that we can form bone with 
iliac crest graft and with recombinant proteins on commercially available scaffolds, we, we just don't feel that they're reliable for larger defects or recalcitrant problems. And so because we were so, because many of these patients have actually had many of these things done to them already, we purely, we, we, it's an option for the patient from the beginning. And do you think in congenital defects where there's a discrepancy in leg length, you can use something like this? We've, we've, done, we've done some of that work, not as part of a trial, but certainly whenever you do an acute lengthening and there's bone defect left behind, the problem always seems to be limitation of, of autograft. That's the issue that is, is a huge clinical problem for us. It's, and the solutions that we have are actually very expensive and poorly tested. So I think the science that we're doing, the studies that we're doing with the MS, the mesenchymal stem cell applications are actually some of the better science that's been done on this specific problem. So, yes. So um, with that and knowing how much work there is to, to, to do, I do just want to point out uh, thank you for those questions. And it is exactly this kind of science that will give more options in the clinical trials. And Diana, you've already benefited from, a, from one of the clinical trials and the use of mesenchymal stem cells, but we need to make it so that there are more options for more patients, for more indications, and that's what this is about. So I want to thank um, Kent, I want to thank Mark, I want to thank Diana for um, a very inspiring spotlight and look forward to much progress to be made on repairing bones and using stem cells to improve lives. Thank you very much.